morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 Prince William County Black History Committee's annual Black History Program. I am Byron Jenkins. I am the chair of the Prince William County Black History Committee, and sharing my moderating duties today is Ms. Kiana Palmer. She is the co-chair of the Prince William County Black History Committee. Good morning. On behalf of the Prince William County Black History Committee, we would like to thank each of you present today and to those who are attending our event virtually. The 2022 Black History theme places focus on black health and wellness, acknowledging the legacy of black scholars and medical practitioners, while placing focus on the importance of healthcare access, preventative care, routine checkups, and maintenance. As we continue to work our way through the pandemic, it has become necessary to develop a greater understanding of how critical it is to maintain balanced health and wellness. The professionals we have with us today will aim to provide the tools that will equip us with knowledge and insight. We hope that you enjoy the program and that you will find the information both beneficial and valuable. For our theme for this year for Black Health and Wellness, hopefully today's discussion will provide useful information to our viewers. Most importantly, although this topic is about black health and wellness, we want to highlight that this information given can apply to anyone, regardless of race. Therefore, no one should be discouraged from asking any health-related questions or any of any of our panelists today. With that, I would like to introduce our panelists, starting from my left. Jennifer McGuire, who is the fitness manager at the Chin Aquatics and Fitness Center. She also is an American College of Sports Medicine certified exercise physiologist. Next, we have Pallavi Deramsey. She is a registered dietitian with the University of Virginia Prince William Medical Center's Cardiac Rehabilitation Department. Next, we have Ms. Amina Jones, MD. She is a primary care physician and CEO and founder of the Be Well of Be Well, <clears throat> a lifestyle telemedicine practice that specializes in diet, nutrition, fitness, and mental health. Next is Nai Williams, Dr. Nai Williams, DDS, a pediatric dentistry practitioner with Precious Smiles of Virginia Pediatric Dentistry in New Newington, Virginia. Dr. Williams was named a top pediatric dentist of 2021 by Northern Virginia Magazine. Next to her is Lori Wilson, a licensed marriage and family therapist, licensed professional counselor, and licensed substance abuse treatment provider. She is the principal at the Dumfries-based Marriage and Family Therapy Solutions, LLC. Next is Art Square Jr. He is a Prince William County Emergency Services Supervisor and is skilled in addressing persons in mental health crisis and substance abuse. Last but not least, Ms. Tisha Colbert is a licensed professional counselor and currently a supervisor with the Prince William County Emergency Service Department. Welcome panel and thank you for participating in today's event. Our professionals will answer questions submitted by viewers today and questions previously submitted online. We will try to answer everyone's question, <clears throat> everyone's questions in the hour we have today. But if your question is not answered while we are live today, you can still submit it through an email. And I will provide that to you later on in the program. The question will be answered by one of our professionals. So with that, let's take the first question. And I'll ask Jennifer this question, please. Jennifer, we have a question, and the question is a two-part question, actually. How do we lose weight, and why is it so hard to do that? Uh, thank you for having me today. Very much appreciated, honored to be here. Uh, that question I get frequently uh, in my line of, of work, and one of the main reasons that I have found in working with individuals is it's so difficult because we have challenges finding time and making time uh, and the, that's two very different things so if we are able to find ways to work within our community 
to offer opportunities that meet people where they're at and give them the strength to continue to their commitments uh, because that's a lot of times what happens is life gets in the way. Uh, we, we have responsibilities, we have work, we have our families and different things along those lines. And so long as you have a supportive network, whether that be internally in your household or within your community, you're going to be more successful with whatever goal that you set, specifically with weight loss. And weight loss, you know, I tell a lot of people, America is tough. It's, it's our society. You know, we have endless options and opportunities to eat whatever we want, whenever we want, and to have the modern conveniences that we do. So it's a recipe often for disaster. And a lot of times the food that is more accessible and readily available is not as healthy. And so, yes, physical activity is part of it, but it's not the only part of it. And I'm glad that there's, you know, nutrition professionals here today to speak to that because it's a huge aspect. And accessibility to those healthy options is something that we have to examine as a whole uh, within our community and within the country in general. So that's, that's why it can be very difficult because there's so much temptation out there and the opportunity to be healthy is something that has to be strived for. It's not something that comes easy. It's something that you have to work for. And, and oftentimes people find far more barriers in their daily living than would be present in, in other countries or within their community, depending on where they live. So. Yeah. I, I think everybody's had some kind of struggles with, with gaining and losing weight. <laughs> and, and if you haven't, you probably will at some time. And if you don't think if you haven't, then God bless you for having good genes. But uh, I guess it's kind of, you kind of saying it's like a lifestyle change, I guess. And the biggest thing is don't be discouraged because it's not about perfection, it's about progression, right? Absolutely. Uh, the key is continuing on and not letting, you know, one slip or one break and the progress. Uh, it is a lifestyle change and it is something that has to be woven in and starting small. I'm probably repeating a lot of what everybody always hears uh, on the news and TV, but it, it can be challenging to even make a small change of I'm going to cook one meal at home a week or I'm going to prepare my lunches for the next three days, not even the full week. That takes time and that takes planning and discipline. And a lot of times with all the distractions that we have, you know, COVID has been a huge uh, challenge for families as well as individuals. And, and we have isolated and not been able to have that support from the community that we are normally used to having, especially in a larger community like ours. So it is a lifestyle change, but it takes more than just the individual. They need support and, and it has to come from many different places. Thank you for that. Um, so in line with uh, lifestyle changes in weight loss, we do have another question for our registered dietitian, Ms. Pallavi DeRamsey. And that question is, there are so many diets out there. What type of diet is best for good health and weight loss? Yes, um, we often come across uh, this question. And um, there are so many diets out there, vegetarian, Mediterranean, keto diet. Um, but health is a matter of healthy habits. It's not one size fits all. The diet that you can follow uh, for a lifetime that meets your personal needs and medical needs is the diet one should follow and focus on we are in a society where we have easy access, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, to all the processed foods. We have busy lifestyles. We don't have time to cook. And uh, these foods are readily available, but they are not necessarily healthy. Um, people need to focus on whole foods, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, beans, lentils, foods that are least processed, foods that require some preparation. And for that, you have to have a commitment. You need to have uh, time. Um, uh, make your uh, uh, menus ahead of time. You have to have time for shopping. You have to, time, have to have a time for cooking. 
And uh, there are some pr processed foods which are not unhealthy, which can be part of your diet, like uh, frozen fruits and vegetables and uh, <clears throat> some low-fat dairy, some uh, plant-based uh, non-dairy alternatives. These are all, this all can be part of healthy diet. I got a follow-up question for that. So you mentioned about uh, whole food and, and, and eating healthy in that, in that regard. I know we hear a lot that people say going to these places and buying these things are so expensive. What's your response to somebody that says, I hear what you're saying, but all that good stuff is so expensive when I can go down the street and get two chicken sandwiches or two fish sandwiches for $4? That's correct. There are healthy alternatives if fresh vegetables are expensive going to frozen vegetables or even canned vegetables. They are good options. They are good options. And um, uh, for example, even the uh, uh, breads. Uh, breads, there are so many breads available on the market. You can go for a store brand bread and not for the other expensive brands. As long as you find the whole grain breads, which are store brands and they can be cheaper than the other brands. I do have a follow-up question to that. Um, when it comes to the different diets that are specialized, mm -hmm. um, so for instance, you have keto, you have Mediterranean, et cetera, how important is it to have a diet that encompasses all food groups? Like, Should one stay away from a particular food group for the rest of their life? Is that healthy or unhealthy? All the, all the food groups are very important. Uh, nowadays, I hear from many of my uh, patients that they are following low-carb diet. But carbohydrates, fats, proteins, they are all macronutrients. They are all major nutrients. They all should be part of well-balanced diet. They all have different functions. What you want to stay away from each food group is the processed foods. There are healthy carbs and there are not so healthy carbs. You want to focus on healthy carbohydrates, which are whole grains, again, I'm repeating fruits, vegetables, lentils, beans, these are whole grains. The same thing goes for fats. There are healthy fats and not so healthy fats. There are fats which are saturated that come from uh, animal foods. Those are not healthy for your heart, but there are, and there are hydrogenated fats, which are, um, uh, coming from the um, uh, fats that are made from uh, vegetable oils and they are hydrogenated. And uh, these foods are very easily accessible, they are cheap, uh, and uh, they, they have a longer shelf life, but they are not good for your health. Whereas the fats which are healthy are monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. The fats uh, that come from nuts, seeds, fish, olives, avocado, um, uh, uh, some um, uh, oils like uh, um, plant-based oil, like olive oil, canola oil, peanut oil. So these are all healthy heads. They sh uh, I'm sorry, healthy fats. They should be part of healthy diet. A lot of good information early in the program. That's great. That's what we're here for. All right, Dr. Jones, I see you over there biting at the, the, the bit. I know you want somebody to ask you a question, so that's, I'm going to ask you one. Um, this word lifestyle, we've heard it before here. The panelists have said lifestyle. I've, I said it too, so lifestyle. So let's kind of qualify that. What exactly is lifestyle medicine? Again, I'd like to thank you and everyone who thought of me to invite me here today. Um, so I am a primary care physician, and what I found was was that a lot of times when I gave a diagnosis, I gave someone the diagnosis of prediabetes or diabetes, or talked to them about, hey, now your cholesterol is high, we gotta talk about medication, along with there's some other things now. So um, the first line treatment is always lifestyle changes. That's the first line treatment. What are lifestyle changes? It's just, it's diet and exercise. It's looking at what your 
you're putting in and what you're burning um, in a simple equation to simplify it. And so a lot of times, you know, in our everyday lives, like we mentioned earlier, um, with your everyday lives, things get a little muddled. You tend to lose track of the fact of, of what you ate or how much you ate or did you eat. Um, and it's hard to fit your health goals into your lifestyle. And so with lifestyle medicine, um, basically what it did is just target on the fact that a lot of the chronic issues that um, that the body or that we diagnose, that the body has to deal with, um, is because of our lifestyle. It's because we're, we're doing a lot, we're just not doing a lot toward our health. Um, so uh, there's some creative things that you know people can do um, and to piggyback off of um, what has already been wonderfully said, you know, if you mentioned that things are too expensive, it, you know, there, there are some Yes, the cost is high for to eat healthy in, in a lot of ways. But during the pandemic, a lot of people found out that they can be um, they can have a little garden in their window uh, on their patio. Um, some of the communities have plots. And so that cut down a lot. Uh, it can cut down a lot, you know, for just simple things like tomatoes and cucumbers. Those are easy to grow. And so, um, you know, when you're looking at, you know, trying to eat whole plant-based foods, that's what lifestyle medicine pushes. Um, it pushes a whole plant-based diet. And I just tell people the difference is, is looking at an orange versus looking at a bottle of orange juice. So it's the that that's what a whole food is. A whole food is you can actually see the food that it is versus you can't see all the processes that has happened to make it whatever you're consuming now. And so the less processed, I agree, absolutely, the better. Um, and just realistically realizing what your lifestyle is. Um, if you're someone who is taking care of elderly parents or taking care of young children, uh, you are running all over the place and you don't have a lot of time to have formal exercise, then you have to set the expectation that you're not going to lose 50 pounds in a week. So in lifestyle medicine, we set realistic goals, right? This is your lifestyle. You want to get to this health goal. It's going to take some time. You're going to have to do it with diet and exercise. And being a medical doctor, yes, you may need some medicine to help you along the way, but you can potentially get off that medicine if you can stick to new healthy habits, which it took you a lifestyle to get there, a lifetime to get there. It's going to take almost as long to change it. That makes sense. And to your point, when you talk about expensive, um, how healthy lifestyle changes are, how expensive they are, I can't help but to think that so are Jordans, so is a Fendi bag, so is a new iPhone, so is a new Samsung. So I guess you have to prioritize what's important to you and how you want to live your life. Because we find spaces and time and place and, and money to do other things, but we don't put that same investment in taking care of our bodies. Two. And Samsung's come and go. <clears throat> Jordans get issued every year, and, and Fendi's and all that stuff come and go, but you only have one body. You have one body, and that's it. And you have to be here to decide how you want to live the rest of your life. You can live it happily. You can live it in pain. You can be fully medicated. You have a choice in doing that. And the earlier you get that done, the better. All right, enough for my soapbox. <laughs> I don't know, Byron. I think that you probably belonged up there in a, on, the, on the dais. Um, that was good information. To switch gears a little bit, we're going to move on to our pediatric dentist, Ms. Dr. Nahi Williams. We have a question for you. And that question is, what age should you start taking your kids to the dentist? All right, thank you also for having me here. That is um, one of the uh, top questions that I get and oftentimes um, one of the most misinformed information that is out there. Um, currently, our recommendation is to take um, your little one to the dentist by age one. Um, and that's usually within six months of them getting their first tooth. And oftentimes, um, I'll say that and I'll get... Um, you know, the question, why that's so early? Why do they need to go to the dentist at that age? But at that initial appointment, it's a lot of information um, given. And we talk a lot about care, oral health care, and prevention. And we find that if we can start, especially with a new parent, if we can start giving that information at this tender age, it builds a lifestyle of a healthy um, oral health care, and it reduces a lot of 
um, restorative fillings, extractions that the child may need in the future. Um, dental caries has been shown to be um, more pre five times more prevalent than asthma in, in, in children. It's the number one cause of children missing school, um, being distracted at school. It's the number one cause. And if we can get a child early on preventive medicine, preventive dentistry, um, along with the parent along that line, um, it's a really good thing. So age one, we'll start them. Oftentimes, it's a look-see educational visit. It doesn't have to be invasive, but we'll start a lot of education at that time. Thank you. Yeah. One of the things that I've learned um, mm -hmm. over the past few years is that overall health mm -hmm. sometimes is linked directly to oral health. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes people don't understand mm -hmm. how important it is to not only have your regular dental checkups, but just to maintain great oral health because it could it could, you know, damage your overall health because you're not taking the steps to do that. So thank yep. you for that. You're welcome. I was going to mention that. <laughs> well, everything you that goes in the body goes through the mouth, right? So we can even start talking about diet at that time. Is that's also a part of the visit? So everything that goes in starts at the mouth. So yeah, it's a part of the overall health. All right, Miss Wilson, you're up next. <laughs> um, I have a question. Uh, it, it says, I would like to talk to someone, but I wonder how can therapy help me? I know that's a big, broad question, but how can someone, how can therapy help somebody if they need to talk to someone? Okay, thank you also for having me here today to talk about uh, mental health. So therapy can have a lot of benefits for people. Um, a therapist can be a, a source of support. A therapist can help a person to identify what's going on in their lives that make them happy, what's going on in their lives that makes them sad, what's going on in their lives that might cause them to feel anxious, uh, to feel depressed, um, to explore maybe some things from their childhood that has not been addressed, that might be causing them some problems um, now in their lives. Um, therapy can help you to look at work-related stress, um, you know, uh, for people who are going through life stage changes, um, for children who are graduating high school, launching off to college and feeling anxiety about that, for people who might have lost a job and they're anxious about how are they going to make it, um, for people who have elderly parents that maybe they're caring for, um, who may be married and having some um, issues with communicating or, or, or with, their, with their spouses or partners. So a therapist can be a neutral person that you can come and talk to and just explore with them any of those things in your life that might be causing you stress or anxiety. And then they can help you to strategize, to figure out how do we overcome these issues that are causing us stress. And they can help you to learn new skills, coping mechanism, um, stress management, anger management. How can you say the things that you feel that you need to say, but say them in a way that people can hear you? So that's a big one that I talk to people um, about that, you know, we can, we can express how we feel, but it's just the way that we say it, right? So that people can hear us. That's good information. That's great information. All this is great information. You know, we hit you with the, 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 the nutrition, with the exercise, and we hit you with the, the mental part. Because all this is about health, overall health, physical and mental health. And I know, especially you know, sometimes in some communities where um, mental health is not really, it's not really, nobody takes, takes advantage of mental health. And we kind of, it has a bad stigma to it if somebody has to go talk to a therapist or do, do those kind of things. But it's not really, and it shouldn't be viewed that way. Because what it does prevent somebody that needs that type of help, they don't get it. And of course, it kind of deteriorates, you know, the, the condition deteriorates from there. But um, if anything we can do today is try to get, knock down some of those stig stigmas and address some of these things and use those things that's around us to, as a support system to get through what we got to do because we got to live this life. 
not only just be physically healthy, but mentally healthy as well. Take care of the overall picture. Can I, can I just add one more thing as you talked about the stigmas? Um, and that is just to say that there was a study that was done that showed that pre-COVID, you know, we've all been, been dealing with the COVID-19, but there was a study that was done that looked at the period from January of 2019 till January of 2021. And in January of 2019, 10% of the adult population reported feeling anxious or depressed. Um, they reported or having a substance use disorder. In January of 2021, 40%, that's a four times increase, presented having a depressive or anxiety or substance disorder that was diagnosable, right? It's not just I'm feeling a little anxious today, but something that required some type of treatment or intervention. So I, I just want to say to folks that we've been living um, with the pandemic, we don't want to blame everything on that, but we do have some data that says that you know across the United States, um, people are dealing with um, mental health issues. And then lastly, I do want to say as well that children are also dealing with issues. Um, we are here celebrating Black History Month, so I just want to leave a, a couple stats with you. In the age population of five to 12 year olds for all children, um, black children ages 5 to 12 die by suicide the most of any ethnic group. And for children, for black teenagers, girls ages 13 to 19, there was a rise of 182 percent from 2001 to 2017 death by suicide. And for black boys ages 13 to 19 by 60 percent death by suicide. So I just want to say that we need to be looking um, at each other. Um, what can we do um, for people who are in your lives, whether they're your children, your friends, your coworkers? Um, if you see a change in their mood that's not improving, just simply talk to them and ask them, you know, how are you doing? Um, there is data that shows that just by checking in with people and telling them and letting them know that you care, it can make a huge difference. So I just wanted to just uh, share a few stats with you just to say that this is a problem across the lifespan um, for children and adults. And we all can do something by simply sometimes just checking in with people and asking how you're doing. This question that I have right now is for Art Square. Um, does the county have a mobile unit to address mental health concerns, especially if a person is acting in such a way they may, that may get them arrested? We have a mobile unit, a crisis responder unit that can come to someone's home um, right now, we have six units. We're in the process of the county granting us funds to have another six units coming out. This mobile unit in, has a police officer, law enforcement, and also has a um, certified pre-screener and mental health professional working with them. And they'll go out with the officers to the person's home and assess the person at the home. If they're in crisis to a point where they need immediate hospitalization, they can do a pre-screening there or if they don't, they just feel they would like to go voluntary, they can transport them to the hospital. Okay. Um, there's been, because of that, there's been like a, um, from what was reported, like 65 decrease in diversion from people having to go to the hospitals. Like going to come, being able to divert them, either going to voluntarily or not having to have them hospital, um, hospitalization, where inpatient hospitalization would be taking place. We also have another question for you, sir, um, mm -hmm. and along those lines. My family member is suffering from a mental health illness, and I want to have them evaluated, but they are, ref are refusing to go to the hospital. What can they do? There's several things they can do. Um, one would be that they would just give us a call and have us talk with them on the phone and find out what might be um, available for them. Um, another thing they can do is we want to look at, start looking at behaviors. They can always reach out to the magistrate to do an emergency, um, emergency custody order, we call ECO, and they could have the person evaluated to be, if or not they need to come in for um, an evaluation. Um, another thing that, as I said earlier, would be a crisis unit. A crisis unit could come to the house and evaluate them there. Um, we have, that crisis unit does have, which I didn't mention earlier, a CTI officer 
The CTI was, is a crisis intervention trained officer that would come with the crisis responder, and they're specially trained to work with those with mental health issues. You're welcome. Hey, Ms. Cowart, we'll come back around to you. We'll, just come back around. we'll get you involved. We'll, we'll ask you the next question, by the way. Um, but I want to go over to uh, Ms. McGuire one time. And, and you probably get this a lot. And I know people, so people say they don't like exercise, right? Obviously, you have to exercise in order to exercise. So it's kind of a, you, you got it. Like my dad used to say, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die, right? So it's the same, same thing. So um, the question is, I don't like exercise, or I don't feel like I have time for it. Does the Chin Center have programs to help me improve my outlook? You know, it's funny that you asked that question because I was sitting here thinking, you know, I didn't even bring up actual exercise very minimally when I first spoke. And it's occurred to me, you know, having this conversation down the line that, I'm hoping I get the people early, right? And in the, in the prevention of a lot of the escalation that we see with these chronic health conditions and different things along those lines. And exercise is the undercurrent to me of this. And I, I don't often use the word exercise. I use the word activity because a lot of times that's what it boils down to is just physical activity. It's stuff that we hear all the time that we've heard over and over and over again, but that oftentimes we forget about because we're too busy or we're in a rush and it's taking the stairs if you can. Uh, it's parking a little further away if you can. It's in a nutrition capacity, focusing on your less or least processed foods, your whole foods, different things along those lines. But as far as the physical activity goes, finding what you enjoy. Uh, I was very blessed to be able to have an experience with athletics throughout my entire life. So that's something that I started at a very young age and was encouraged to do uh, and, and continued all through throughout my college and then after. I know not everybody has that experience. I know not everybody feels successful. Not everybody has the same experience with health and wellness at young ages. And, you know, very similar to the dentistry. It, it's something that we can start immediately, you know, doing fun activities with your children and getting them outside. I think, if anything, that is, that is one potentially positive thing of the pandemic is that people started going outside. I, I saw far more people walking up and down the road that I live on, and I thought, oh, finally, this is, this is wonderful. Just getting out and walking, finding the time to be able to do that. And I really hope that people set that boundary and stick to it, that they are guarded of their time and protective of their time that invests in their health and their wellness through physical activity. It can be walking. I, I love walking. Um, I get teased a little bit. I was interviewed uh, by Fox 5 and said that I love to dance and garden, and that's probably not true at all. I don't like to dance so much, uh, and I garden only because I started a very, very small garden in our front yard for my son. And tomatoes in the summer. That's our favorite thing. So it can be something that simple. It started out on our deck in a pot. It was nothing huge, but one summer was successful. So we continued on and grew it a little bit more. And, and that's an activity. That's something that, yes, you physically have to get out and do something, but it's also going to benefit you in another way. So there's different things that are available. I'm, I, I'm shamelessly going to plug our parks because we have some of the best parks and facilities within the area, let alone Northern Virginia. Uh, Chin Center is just a part of that. We're just one cog in the wheel, and we absolutely have programs. Uh, we have a fee-based membership. We have fee-based programming, but that doesn't mean that you don't have access to a park right down the street. Uh, several different things have been on the rise. So for example, we have a new park that's 
already open, but we haven't done the official ribbon cutting. It's the Harbor Drive Wellness Park. And I went out and did a site visit the other day, and it was busy with children on the playground, the fully accessible playground. So anybody of any uh, ability can utilize that. And it has accessible fitness equipment, outdoor fitness equipment, a beautiful, hopefully in the spring, pollinator garden. So we're planning some really great free activities. We're working with Kaiser Permanente to offer these opportunities to the community specifically to underserved communities that have a hard time getting out because that is a walkable park. It's right down the street from a lot of different things. So that is a priority that Prince William has really invested in and I hope to continue to see that is these walkable communities, these multimodal communities and that's that's such a multi-pronged effort like every you know, professional that we have up here today. It takes this kind of partnership to be able to put those things together. So it's just really exciting. And, and physical activity doesn't have to be exercise. It doesn't have to be what I refer to as the hamster wheel. You don't have to get on the, tre the treadmill every day. If you like that, that's great. That's not for everybody. There's so many different options out there and so many things available. You just find what you enjoy and go from there. That's really the basis for that. Yeah, um, I think that what you, you're basically saying, yeah, just start off small, whatever you can do. And I think the Ramsey, Mr. Ramsey hit, hit the point, you know, you have to do what's catered for you. Don't worry about what Dwayne The Rock Johnson does. If all you can do is walk, that's, that's better than not doing anything at all. And at the, at the center, I see so many individuals who come to our center in particular who have some of the most significant mobility challenges that you can experience. Uh, and they go up the stairs and they go down the stairs and we have an elevator and I can't count the number of times my office is downstairs and I go up the stairs and I'm behind somebody and they're, I'm so sorry, I'm going slow. I say, you're going, you know, so you keep going. I'm not in a rush. Just do what you need to do at your own pace. Good for you because you made it here today and you did what you needed to do. That is part of that huge obstacle for a lot of people to overcome start where you're at that's all it's about find something that you don't hate <laughs> and go from there that's that's really the key and hopefully you know it's a partnership with the community with the professionals within the community so that they're supporting and it's so refreshing to hear that there's there's partners out there who are supporting the preventative care because that's a major thing and and physical activity and nutrition in particular are big big parts of that. So again, just really grateful to have the opportunity to share that with everybody. So we're going to circle back to Ms. Cohort. Um, we have another mental health question. I have a family member who needs mental health services. Why does it take so long to receive inpatient hospital care? We are mandated to contact a specific number of private hospitals before we contact a state hospital. However, unfortunately right now, due to the current pandemic, there's been a bed crisis in the state of Virginia. And so that has um, lessened the amount of beds that are available to the um, clients that we, we serve. Okay. I'm not I think I just, I'm not sure if this question comes up a lot at, at the workplace, but I know um, I used to work for Public Safety Communications, the 911 Center, and there, you know, uh, of course, that's a very stressful, stressful job. How, do you give any advice or feedback for those who do work in stressful jobs, but they don't have the opportunity to sometimes decompress, you know, they, or maybe they take you know, the stress home and they're not able to kind of deal with that, that stress and, you know, what they have to do during the day and sometimes, you know, just taking on other people's issues and concerns. Can you speak to that when you have a stressful job? I know it's sort of, you know, kind of mental health, but if you can speak to that, if you're under stress, what can you do to de-stress in the workplace? Um, Self-care, that's huge. And that's the one thing that I would I would really, really um, talk with that person about and, you know, use myself. Find something that you enjoy, something and do that, um, some, anything. Um, but, I mean, adopt some type of uh, routine of some type of self-care that you um, 
can engage in that uplifts your mood. Um, I mean, for, for different people, it's different things. For me, it's just spending time with my family and, you know, going out and doing things. It could be, di and it's, you know, I just let them know, just find something that um, will uplift your mood and then adopt, intentionally adopt that routine and do it to de-stress. Can I interrupt? It's me. <laughs> so to piggyback off of what you said, um, I also uh, try to remind people boundaries, right? So at work, especially if you have a very stressful job, sometimes lunch never happens. Your morning bleeds into lunch, which bleeds into the afternoon, which then you got to run and cat and pick up Johnny from aftercare because it's 630 and you're going to be charged. And um, not saying that I know that feeling. Um, but I'm just saying that sometimes you got to build boundaries, right? And so sometimes um, I adopted this word from a girlfriend of mine called a hard stop. And sometimes it's hard. I'm a, I am admittedly a workaholic. My name is Amina, and I'm a workaholic. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I take my computer home, so my computer comes with me. Work is always with me. I work seven days a week. And um, as of this year, I've learned to enforce boundaries. So I try to encourage, you know, my patients that come in that um, have health issues. So this is that thing where we kind of lay out, why, how did we get here? And I lay out, okay, your lifestyle is leading to this. Where can we make some hard stops? And a hard stop sometimes can be you're going to have lunch. Even if lunch means to walk outside for 15 minutes, that's what you're going to do, right? So there's different ways that we can kind of come together and just um, see what realistically works for you. But um, there's things called hard stops and boundaries that you have to make. Pick a day of the week where you are not doing work because you need that downtime. And you'll find that, or, or sleep. Sleep is which is one of the pillars in lifestyle medicine, it is, you, I can't stress it enough how important it is. So nonetheless, hard stops, boundaries, especially during your work day or even when you go home, being able to look your family in the eye while they're talking instead of like looking at your computer, not saying I know about that either. But, you know, these are things that you have to adopt. So I agree, self-care and boundaries, hard stops. I'll send another comment to that. Um, no problem. Um, I agree boundaries are really important. And I know sometimes, I know for us, the job that we work in, um, we get a lot of stress um, on a regular. And we can say the truth for everyone in this panel of what we see and experience daily. I know what I've incorporated in my life is when I come through the door, I change. I make sure I leave what's outside outside and what's inside is inside. And for some people I've found that I've worked with and I've talked to, that's what I've suggested to them is learn how to make a, that, a hard boundary for yourself, like you were saying, that you can simply make a difference right there. Because when you come in a household, if you bring in the stress that you've experienced from your job of seeing something, experiencing someone with a mental health crisis, and then come in your home and you have children and your wife, or, you know, that's, that's not what you want to bring or your husband. You don't want to bring that into your home. So therefore, you make that hard boundary. So you come in the house and put your bag down, your computer. You put, <laughs> okay. Um, for me, as I put my backpack down, I put it aside, and I go and change, and then I come back downstairs and, and I start my family life. You know, so, and I just add one other thing to that. It's it's such a, a powerful question because we all have um, work related stress, and so we can have other stresses in our life. So as I was hearing the panel talk, um, one, a simple thing that I started doing with my clients is just drawing a circle on a piece of paper, just getting a white piece of paper and drawing a circle. And we all know that there's 24 hours in a day, right? And I heard uh, the doctor say, you know, sleep is very important. Um, it is extremely important. So we should get eight hours of sleep a day. So if you draw a circle, I'm from the South, we cook a lot of pies down there, right? <laughs> so think about a pie chart. And if you cut it into, th into three pieces, eight hours of sleep, work on that. Try to get close to eight hours of sleep. And then we're supposed to work eight hours a day, right? We're supposed to work eight hours a day. That's it, right? That's that hard boundary. <laughs> it's hard for me too, because believe me, all right? But eight hours a day. So if you can just imagine a pie, I tell my clients, draw the pie, stick it on your refrigerator, put it by your desk. It can be on even a little sticky, right? So you got eight hours of sleep, you got eight hours of work, and then you got eight hours of other stuff. So. Uh, it also goes to once you get home, you leave it. You leave it at the door. 
But that eight hours of other stuff is, is really important, right? Those are those eight hours in there. There's my time, me time, self-care time. So self-care could be taking a walk. Self-care could be preparing a meal for myself. Self-care could be meditating. Self-care could be just having silence, turning off the TV. Uh, Self-care could be a lot of things. But also, you should also have other people in your life. That's your time for your partner. That's your time for your children. That's your time for your parents, your siblings, your, for your friends, right? So eight hours of your day, you should be doing something other than working or sleeping. You should be building in other things, things that you like to do, some things that you have to do. I tell people that eight hours that you're not working and sleeping, you got to pay your bills, right? You got to go grocery shopping. You should be able to take a walk. I should be able to go out and have you know dinner with my girlfriends. I should be able to do things with my husband. So that eight hours is important. And I say to people, be intentional. Be intentional about the eight hours that is yours in your day. Make your, your pie chart, but be intentional. Because so often, we can allow other people or other things to fringe on those eight hours that are for me. So be aware that if you've got other people, you know, coming into your time, um, or if you have other things that are coming into your time that you have not chosen, then you're kind of losing control. So just think about that. Balance eight, eight, and eight. Some powerful stuff out here, folks. And powerful things make you empowered, right? And empowered it makes when you get empowered, you feel better about yourself. You get control of your life, and you understand how you fit in and what you need to do. This right here is elevating everybody to a higher level. All this information. Did you have something you want to say? Go ahead, Tisa. Um, I do want to piggyback everything that we've said, and just kind of just provide this as well. Communicating those needs to the ones at work, at home, and true story. My husband communicated to me he needed 15 minutes when he walked in the door. That's it. And so that's what he gets. When he, he would walk into the door um, at the time when he would go into the office, we let him do whatever. Once the 15 minutes is up, boom, we had our family time. So just communicating what you need basically to your boss at work, what is, you know, those needs look like um, in, at home, family, friends, and children. Again, I love this. This is all taking control of your life, your individual life. You don't have it after, after this is gone. Take advantage of it while you're here. And I love all this. is great information. I'm so excited. I can't contain myself. Oh, Lord Jesus. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, let's keep it moving. Um, we, oh, okay, Ms. DeRamsey. I am saying that right, right? Yes, sir. I'm going to go home and keep <laughs> saying that because I love the way that sounds. <laughs> Sounds weird, but I like it. I like it. Now that I know how to say it, that's probably why. <laughs> so this is the big question. This is the big crazy question. This, these, two, these two elements that we have in our, in our lives, these two minerals, these two crystals, these two little small crystals. And you all, I see, Ms., I see Dr. Jones shaking her head. <laughs> Salt and sugar. The dreaded two things that would probably kill you faster <laughs> than anything I've experienced in my 26 years of being a cop in the street. Um, we would address the, the, the salt part for us. So question is, is avoiding the salt shaker enough to cut sodium intake, especially if I have high blood pressure or other chronic health issues? So most of the um, salt or sodium, they're interchangeable terms, okay? Most of the sodium in our diet comes from processed foods, 77% of the sodium. Yes, it comes from the processed foods. 5% is may, may be added on the table, and 5% uh, to 6% occurs naturally in, in foods, like milk has sodium, uh, some fruits have sodium, some vegetables have sodium. Um, so most of the sodium that comes in our diet is from processed foods, and that is not healthy for you. And uh, based on <laughs> based on American, you know, based on the dietary guidelines, everybody should be uh, restricting uh, sodium uh, uh, their sodium intake to 2,300 milligrams or less per day. And one teaspoon of salt, one teaspoon of salt has 2,300 um, um, milligrams of sodium. And uh, if people are with chronic conditions such as heart problems. 
they have to limit their sodium to less than 1500 milligrams per day. So uh, definitely just cutting the salt shaker is not going to do the job. Uh, avoiding the processed foods, ultra processed foods. That is the big message for everybody here um, and for, uh, for, uh, from children to all stages of life. Thank you for that. So the biggest thing, I guess, reading labels. Reading yes. labels is very important. very important. And again, sticking to the plant-based whole foods, the foods that are least processed. Right. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, we are getting down to the wire for our program, but we do have one last question um, that we're going to ask of Dr. Williams before we move it over to our acting CXO, Mr. Johnson. And that question is, are thumb sucking and pacifier habits harmful for my child's teeth? And if so, when should I stop that habit? All right, thank you. Another wonderful question that I get all the time. Um, the thumb sucking and the pacifier is technically not considered a habit until the child is between three to four years old. Um, Non-nutritive sucking is a way that a child will pacify themselves, and that's normal. And so if we have a one-year-old who you know, enjoys the thumb or the pacifier, I tell my patients, not a big deal. You're going to stress yourself out more that trying to stop this child than the child. Um, most kids will give it up on their own between three and four years old. Um, so that is usually the time when I'll say, try to get a little bit more active with trying to end the, the pacifier thumb sucking. Um, and by that, try the least invasive methods first, because most kids are ready to give it up. And usually just positive reinforcements, a chart, a reward, usually does the job. It's really just a handful who really won't give it up. Yeah, so, and, um, and at that point, if there's any changes to the jaw, it usually corrects itself. So, no big deal, no stress. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, panel. I appreciate all the information that's been shared today. Um, hopefully, we've all been a little smarter by being here. <laughs> I know I am. Um, unfortunately, this top, that's all the time we have for questions at this point. Uh, again, if your question was not asked, um, please submit it to pwcbhc at pwcgov.org. Uh, that email address is at the bottom of the screen. And you will be able to receive your answer from one of today's panelists. And at this time, I have the dubious pleasure of introducing our newest acting uh, county exec, Mr. Elijah Johnson, who will deliver some remarks. Well, thank you for that, uh, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I don't have a lot of remarks. I just want to compliment this panel that you've put together and all the, th all the information that you've shared with our community today. Um, we, we in the county, our vision is elected leaders, staff, and individuals, families, and businesses work together to make our county a community of choice. And you've illustrated that today by the information you've shared we are able to then pass that on to our communities. You've talked about our programs in public, in the parks and to, park recreation and tourism. You talked about our community services. You all represent our private sector and the resources that you bring to our community. What an opportunity to share and do that. I'm going to go see my dentist now. <laughs> Haven't been in a while. Um, maybe if you were my dentist when I was a kid, I'd be less afraid. Um, that me time you all talked about. Me and my wife just had a conversation. She sends me a text, say, hey, the best way to a woman's heart, attention. Those little things that you all talked about and that self-care, um, we are working on a lot of things in the county to improve our services for our community, to make sure you're getting the health care that you need, the services that you need from a health perspective. One of the things you mentioned, you mentioned the pandemic. One of the things I want to encourage folks out there that are listening, and, 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 and I know there's a lot, everybody has their own opinion, but if you haven't made the choice to be vaccinated, I encourage you to do so. Um, and that's protection for yourself and your family, especially our communities of color. If you haven't thought about it, 
Think again by listening to this panel, what they've told you about self-care and taking care of your family and your community. And we will live into being a community of choice. So again, thank you for our panelists. Thank you for our wonderful team and our Black History Month committee for putting this program together. You ran out of time and I was waiting to go another hour. So you may have to have them back to do another session. Um, but again, thank you all for doing this. We really appreciate it. I, can't, I just can't tell you the amount of information and the statistics that you've given us today is very helpful. I mean, there was just to hear those things a shock, especially the suicide rate that in our communities. That is something near and dear to my heart. We gotta, we gotta make some improvement in those areas. So we got some work to do. But as a community, I'm sure we can meet the challenge. Have a great day, folks. Hey, thank you, Mr. Johnson, for those words. All right, everyone, this concludes our presentation uh, for 2022. I want to thank our panelists first for sharing your Saturday with us. I know you could be somewhere else, but I feel really honored to have everyone here for us to get together and have this presentation. And it's not, we're not doing it for us. We're doing it for somebody else. We're doing it for the community. We're doing to help improve the lives. All of you will have information that you shared with us today. And I'm telling you, I am, and I don't mean it as a cliche, smarter, smarter for that, but I am. And there's some things that I'm going to do in my personal life and being a diabetic, I know some of the things I'm going to improve on. And, and a lot of these th things are great. And I'm always, we always focus, everybody generally focuses on the physical part of health. But you have to check in with the mental health too. If you want to exercise your your muscles, you got to exercise that brain. You got to check in on that on that brain part. And then obviously spiritual too. Eventually, right down the road, and we haven't addressed that today. But again, having a well being a well rounded person so that you can be a better person, not only for yourself but for your community and for people around you. And I think that's what we're on on this planet for. Um, I also would like to thank my co-host, Kiana. She did so well. I appreciate that. Offline, we had a whole different conversation, but she did very well. Yeah, I threw you out there. <laughs> also, I'd like to thank the County Board of Supervisors for allowing us to use their space. We appreciate that. Otherwise, we'd probably be using a tent outside in the wind, <laughs> which I don't think we would have had a lot of participants anyway. <laughs> um, also, I'd like to thank um, the, the, the behind the scenes people, uh, Prince William County Office of Communications uh, and, the county, and the County Department of Information Technology who have set up this, these, this wonderful uh, technology, this communication device that we're using today, uh, the support for the television, all, all the stuff, everything that we see tech, technology-wise, they, they're the ones responsible for this. So they do a great job, and uh, I'm, I'm very impressed on how, how they've done things, I am personally. Um, and also, my, my, my no, our, our committee and the support that we've received putting this thing together, um, we've done two of these things virtually now. Well, one virtually last year, and now this one's remotely and virtually. Uh, doing it in person is easy. That's simple, getting everything together. But doing it this way with this new technology, with COVID, everything happening, it, it, it is something. And it takes a lot out of you. But the, the, the people in that committee, they have put forth their, their best effort. And we have some, some people here today as support. And um, they've just, just been phenomenal. I, I couldn't be in the position I am. And I, and I think. Ke uh, Keona says the same, will say the same thing. We would not be able to do our job if we didn't have people around us. But I think part of that is knowing better to surround us, people, surround ourselves with good people. So <laughs> makes us look good. And then last but not least, all the people that participated today in today's conversation. I hope everybody got something out of it, gained something out of it, and um, hopefully it, it works towards being a better you and a better person for the, from here and, and, and going forward. Okay, so everyone, everybody stay safe. We'll see you at next year's program, if God willing, and um, take care.